happen because I'm not right here. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a workshop about preparedness. Um, I am going to turn it over to Amy in just a moment. Um, and Amy, I've made you a co-host. Have you, are you able to share your screen once I stop sharing? Um, yeah, no, I don't, I think we'll have to have you share it because I, as I, I think my, my screen is so full, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to the PowerPoint. Okay. So, um, so if you can share it, um, and, um, that would be great. So, um, let me pull that up. This is why we have contingencies, right? More than one person has the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, while you're doing that, we don't need that yet, but it would be great um, if people would for this moment and you feel comfortable doing that, um, going on screen and um, maybe we can just, I'm gonna give, you know, a. You, you have my big bio, so you don't really need it, but I'll just tell a little bit, but if other folks could, either put in the chat or say who you are and your affiliation um, of your organization, or if you're an artist, what your discipline is, that would be really helpful to start. Um, so I'll just say, I'm Amy Schwartzman. I'm actually coming to you from Brooklyn, New York, um, land of the Lenape Munse. And um, I have a background in doing arts and emergency preparedness going back to actually 9-11. Um, and before that, I was a dancer for years and I ran arts organizations. And at that point, I worked for the New York Arts Recovery Fund in New York City, which we were created to help artists and arts organizations recover. We gave out grants and did education and advocacy. And since then, I've actually worked for FEMA after Hurricane Sandy. I am a consultant with the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, which you'll hear about, and the Performing Arts Readiness Project. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today with you guys um, and um, thank South Arts for making this possible. So um, if anyone wants to go, I, I can go in my, uh, Jessica, you know, um, Karanda, do you wanna just give a brief intro, very brief intro? And then we'll go just quickly. Um, yeah, certainly. Good morning, everyone. Karanda Baker, Assistant Program Director here at South Arts. Um, please feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat, and I'll be keeping those um, in track so that we can make sure that they get voiced throughout the session. Jessica, do you want to say anything more about yourself? Uh, just welcome, and I'm glad everyone's here. Um, and I see that people are already putting their names and affiliations in the chat. So Amy, if we wanted to save some time, we could yeah. just um, allow that process to continue and yes. really dive right into the content. Thank you all for your patience this morning and a happy Thursday. <laughs> so um, actually what we're going to do is we are going to start off with a poll for you guys. I have a bunch of questions. So Jessica will share her screen and you're going to see a poll appear um, and I'll read the questions as well and you can answer them. Um, so these are, yes, basically yes, no, but first one is, have you experienced a disaster? Um, and think about whether you think of COVID-19 as a disaster or not. Um, so you wanna say personally, organizationally, even if it's not your current organization. And um, if you're not sure, you can put that in. And then we're sort of going to go through as you answer it, which is about different kinds of disasters that might happen, certain natural events, answer them as you can. And then we have some human-made disasters that follow. And let's see. Let's see if people are getting through, good. Um, okay, some are not, yeah, we're not seeing it all. So probably I'm gonna say yes. Okay, so you've gone through it. How many of you felt prepared for it before it happened? And I can see basically 100% did not feel prepared. How many of you feel prepared now? So the number is going up a little bit. Um, a lot of people are not sure, which actually makes perfect sense. Uh, do you feel intimidated by the process of preparedness? So about a third of you do, a third no. 
um, and somewhat, I'm not sure. And when we go back and look at uh, disasters, I want to see that um, a lot, the majority of you have personally experienced it, fewer organizationally, um, so I'm not sure. Hurricanes, it makes a lot of sense that if we're talking about the Southeast, that that's a lot. Tornadoes flooding more. Mudslides are much more a kind of West Coast phenomenon. Um, extreme cold, heat wave, not so much. Pandemic, obviously, and fire. Power outage, that's a big one for everyone. Civil disturbance, not as much. Recession, yes, we're all going through that. Um, theft or robbery, cyber. Um, so great. And now I have a few more questions that we can uh, actually stop sharing the poll because what we're going to do is sort of go to more where you can enter things in the chat as well. And um, so I wanted to know what does preparedness mean to you? And you can just enter what you're thinking as it comes up. And there is no right answer or wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. So situ Norwood says situational awareness and readiness, able to project the worst case scenario and have a plan, having the resources to handle the disruption, anticipation, awareness, Great. Anyone else have any other thoughts that they want to add? You can continue to do that. Um, I'm going to ask you now, what do you worry about most in regard to your organization, if you're here on behalf of an organization, um, and in terms of a disaster, and if you're an individual artist, again, what do you worry about most in regard to a disaster? Not having an experienced leader. Okay. That's important. And we're gonna talk about something called process management, which actually makes that a process that is more spread out. Um, anyone else have any other thoughts on that about your particular, in terms of your organization and what you worry about most in regard to a disaster? Obviously safety, primary, archive protection, fiscal recovery, loss of space. Yes, in certain disasters that can happen. Um, absolutely, or some damage to the space. Um, okay. I have a question now that is related to COVID. And I certainly do. I mean, I think this seems like all of you, you know, experienced COVID. To me, that was a major disaster. And what I want to say, even for those of us who actually work in the space of disaster management, certainly in arts disaster management, even though we always knew there was this possibility of a pandemic, people were not really prepared. It's a very different kind of disaster. And I mean that in terms of hospitals were not prepared. The people who really were on the front lines of that were not prepared and plans were not in place in this country. And that is a terrible thing because obviously, you know, even though it was out there and we all knew about it, we weren't thinking about it. I asked people about it beforehand when I worked with them, but I will admit that I didn't think about it. And the thing about it, it was such a different kind of disaster in that in a lot of natural disasters, the big thing is you don't have communication. We had tons of communication in COVID, right? But the issue was, how were you gonna perform your mission? How were you gonna do your work if you had an exhibit coming up and you couldn't get there, what was gonna happen? So totally different framework for that. And that's why we really have to think in a very global way about things and really, you know, really all those possible contingencies. But in terms of COVID, I want to know if you were able to pivot during COVID-19 and if you pivoted, which I assume almost all of you did, how did you do that? And let's, people can also, let's say, put that in the chat as well. And if you want to say something out loud, please feel free to unmute and speak to the rest of us and say that. Um, So yes, online class offerings, that was a huge thing that organizations figured out how to do, and individuals too. I know individual dancers who did the same. Um, hey, question Amy, if you like, we're happy uh, on the South Arts side to read out some of the um, things that are in the chat. So folks who are watching this who may not have access to that, 
um, can also hear some of those responses as well. Sure, sure, yes. Yeah, and I'm seeing some of them, but sure, feel free to go ahead and do that. I mean, I can I can also do it. Um, I just wanna say, yeah, people were forced to go virtual because buildings were closed. Somebody went back to school for a master's in gallery and museum management online. So yeah, I mean, it was this major pivot was to an online world. Um, were you, if you're an organization, were you able to maintain programming? And if you're an artist, were you able to go forward and uh, do any kind of exhibits that you might've had? Um, presumably you were able to do your own work. Any thoughts about that? And then a big one for organizations, I'd like people to sort of think about, did the nature of your organization, and if you're an artist, your art practice change as a result of the crisis? Certainly throughout the crisis, people pivoted. But did anything happen in terms of where you are now and how your organization runs or your art practice runs? Um, somebody who's a singer said no, there were not changes. Change of gathering size, online exhibit, yes. Um, think about things about you know the nature of how you do things as well. Were there changes in staffing? Were there changes in your IT work? Insurance, did you think about that? Anything else? Um, Jessica says, in my past organization, we quickly raised money to award to artists who lost income. We had to wave a lot of red tape to get people money quickly. People moved more into the digital format of working. Molly says that she created artist emergency grants program. And that was a big thing. I mean, for those of you who are artists, many of you may have benefited from artist relief and nationwide program that came on. And then Molly is doing work. I know because Molly and I know each other for many years from South Arts and N Caper, but um, in terms of working with the New York Foundation for the Arts and they really pivoted and really brought on special programs. For organizations and individuals, can you just say um, maybe People can do a show of hands or put a hands up in your uh, screen, but are you maybe more lean and mean now? Okay, I'm seeing people who are, you know, here shaking their heads. I think people learn, how do you operate with less? And, and you know, that can have an, an impact for the future. Um, and just kind of um, what lessons may you have learned that we haven't, you haven't already put in the chat or stated um, through COVID about how to pivot and how to continue fulfilling your mission, if it's anything that you didn't already say. And again, feel free to put it in the chat or say it out loud. So um, Norwood also adds an increase in online experiences with organizations and academics abroad, arts fairs and studio tours went online. And yeah, really, maybe really good thing about that was a lower carbon footprint. So there can be positives, disasters are horrible, but we learn lessons from them and sometimes they also present themselves as opportunities. So that's something to think about. Um, Molly's talking about document what you do and how you do it. This is something really important and we are gonna talk about that. Um, so you've already said, I mean, a lot of people feel a little bit intimidated about the process of preparedness. Um, and, you know, I, I wanna say some of the things that I've learned from people which can help make preparedness a difficult thing to do. It feels huge. It feels intimidating. You don't know how to put it in place. Um, I've talked to a bunch of artists recently. And one of the things that I've heard from a lot of them, it's not that they haven't thought about preparedness, but some of the issues are that they have not had the money to do some of the things that need to be done. Sometimes it's time, sometimes it's money. And that probably is true for organizations as well. Um, so, one thing I do want to say, though, and this came up here, yes, COVID was horrible. You got through it. You changed. Hopefully, it didn't have devastating effects on your organization. Most organizations I know, I will say, there are organizations that I know of in New York that no longer exist. They absolutely went out of business, and that is a very sad result of this. But there are others that really learned to pivot, did learn to become more lean and mean, did learn how to adjust and how to change things. So hopefully you did learn skills there that you can take into the future and that you've incorporated into what you do now that are lessons about preparedness. Okay, so now Jessica, um, we can open up the PowerPoint.
So thank you for that. Um, And I, we have a thank you here from South Arts from Norwood, which really is saying thank you for being there for us and for all the organizations that did pivot. So um, we're going to talk about preparedness ABCs and really what does it mean to have a preparedness mindset. And I think, right, I have the ability, Jessica, yes, to advance this, although I'm not seeing those little buttons right now. Um, Jessica, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, anyone... I'll move it. If you want to just tell me when to advance, since I'm sure yeah, you can move to the next screen, slide. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Ah, and now I see it. Okay. So we're going to talk about what is this idea of a preparedness mindset. And you can see I've chosen two images here, which to me represent part of what we're talking about. Um, one is this person with a telescope looking far ahead, um, anticipating outcomes, projecting contingencies is what I'm adding, right? So the farther ahead you can look and think things through and what are contingencies? Contingencies are those what if kinds of questions. Um, well, what if such and such happens? What if the flood can, you know, comes in my window? What will happen then? And if you realize the issue of what can happen, then it helps you think through, how do I go about addressing that? So looking far ahead, being nimble, being flexible. This guy's trying to get his balance on a teeter board. Um, and that's really important, having that kind of preparedness mindset and that sort of flexibility mindset. Um, we talk about the issue of resilience and resilience is also often referred to as this sort of ability to bounce back. You know, if something happens, your resilience is the thing that helps you get back to where you were before the disaster. But one thing I want to put out there is something for all of us to be thinking about in the framework of this kind of uh, thing is that if where you were prior to a disaster was not in a satisfactory place, and this is true very much of vulnerable communities, artists can be vulnerable, Folks in the arts sector can be more vulnerable than others because perhaps we're not as well funded as others to do the work that we need to do. BIPOC people, more you know, poverty, different groups, may, the elderly may be more vulnerable. So any kind of thing that provides a vulnerability may mean that you are not starting out in the same place and therefore recovery can be harder. So we do want to build things within ourselves and within our organizations, but we also want to recognize that this goes beyond us and sometimes what needs to happen needs to happen in the community. Those wrongs, those vulnerabilities need to be redressed elsewhere. And another really vital thing to know is that it isn't though always a matter of money and financial resources. Your connectedness your belonging into and among a community of peers, working together with others, being supported in that way, can go huge ways towards helping you achieve this stability and strengthen that preparedness mindset. If you know who to reach out to, if you know where to get information and having information and knowing where resources are and having some of that at least in place beforehand, you're here today taking this class, is very helpful because the more you know about how to be better prepared, the more you are able to initiate and integrate that into what you do and the better off you will be. So we wanna recognize also, we wanna recognize, and we're gonna talk about this more vulnerabilities and risks. If we know our vulnerabilities, then we can adjust to them. If we don't know them, we can't do that. So you need to think about these things we think far in advance and what we can do, and then we also think sometimes when we have notice of an impending disaster, what can we do in that moment to move forward, right? If, if the hurricane's coming immediately, well, that's when we're gonna board up our windows. We're not gonna board them up before then. So some things we can do far in advance and think it through, other things we know we need to do, but they only become relevant in the moment of a disaster about which we have notice. And sometimes we don't. And of course, those are the harder ones to cope with. Again, agility and flexibility. And I hope there were some organizations I know initially registered for this that are actually are artist networks. 
And I've talked about connectedness and community, but one of the things is as we build networks, we also strengthen ourselves because being part of a network provides you peer support. It provides you communication and information sometimes. It enables you to be able to report issues if you have them, and it really helps us. And we'll talk about that later in terms of a resource that exists. You also need to know if you're an organization, what makes your organization your organization? Um, and let's move, uh, Jessica, to the next slide for this. So you really need to understand what are your core or your critical assets and what must continue no matter what. This was originally written for the organization, but then the class was expanded to artists. So think of this more than for yourself, but it's either for your organization or yourself. But what's critical? What must happen no matter what for your organization to be your organization? or for you in your artistic practice to move forward. So what are core operations and programs, right? You need to know those. And we're gonna actually, um, in a few minutes, we're gonna break out actually into some uh, breakout groups that we're gonna do assign randomly, but it's gonna give you a chance. So start thinking. You wanna think substantively, programmatically, and operationally. And then you also wanna think in terms of procedures, right? procedures, and I'll give you one just right up front, which I think is something that if you're an organization, you absolutely need to have in place. So you won't need to think this one through, but you have to think about how are we going to pay people, right? If, if communications are out, and again, wasn't an issue during COVID, how can you pay people? You have to figure out some kind of process and procedure to have in place for your, um, for your actual payroll. How will that happen? And there are clues that I can give you about that that we'll talk about a little bit afterwards, but the major thing is to I identify what these are. And today I'm only gonna ask you to either focus on one core or critical operation or program. And for artists, put that in place for yourselves. What does that mean for you? And one critical or core procedure. But when you go back to your organization or beyond this, and we've talked about this a little bit, then you have the sort of framework for which to do this yourself. And I wanted to say one other thing. Remember that a disaster doesn't have to happen. What we are gonna talk about later are hazards and crises, they will happen. But the more you can put in place in advance to kind of immunize yourself from the results of the potential results of those, the less they are likely to be a disaster. Um, okay, so let's um, go to putting people into breakout groups. And I'm going to give you, um, let's see the time here. Let's say we're going to have about, um, we have, so, I don't know, We have, are we going to do, maybe do we have two weeks worth, Jessica, do you think? Let's see. Or I'm sorry, Amy, what was the I'm question? I'm trying to look at the number of people that we have here. So are we going to do about two groups, you think, or three? Um, can... Let me see what is suggested when I um, bring up the breakout rooms. So give me okay. just one moment. So while you're in your group, please do try to have assign at least one, assign a person who will be then reporting back to the full group when you come when we come back. And um, even take a moment within your group, take about two minutes or so to think through on your own what would be your one that's related to programmatic, and then the other that's related to procedural. And you can generate a larger list if you want, but really just do that. But then after each of you come up with your own, share them with each other and, and do say, you know, what kind of organization you are, because it's gonna be different in different kinds of organizations or whether you're an individual artist, and then it can open up some discussion. People may share from what others have shared. They may realize, oh wait, yeah, that's really true for me too. Think about whether that changes your idea. Remember, later you're going to be able to generate a much bigger list of these items, but you really want to know, you know, what makes us us or what makes me and my practice my practice and what must happen no matter what so that you know when you're prioritizing a plan what you really need to focus on. This will be the most important thing. These will be the most important things that you're looking to sort of put into action first to make sure that you have the ability to do those should a disaster happen. So, so it looks like we have three rooms. Does that work with about four people per room? Yeah, 
not. That seems good. It gives them enough time. So we're going to give, I'm going to, we're going to give you come back earlier. If you're done, you have the option to do that, I think, but otherwise we'll give you about, um, yeah, I think we can give you about seven minutes. Okay, let's see, one new message here. Welcome back, Jessica says. So yes, welcome back everybody. Are we all back? Jessica, is everyone back from, or all the rooms back? Yes, ma'am, feel free to move forward. Okay, okie dokie. Okay, that was Karanda, thank you. Okay, so now um, each of you, um, for each group, um, Let's go through which group would like to go first, and I'll then give you the kind of prompts. We're going to sort of talk about what did you um, identify when you did this? Um, were there commonalities? And I'm curious about, you know, whether being part of the group helped people realize things and think things through. Did it change what you had initially had in your mind when you thought of it on your own? And let's talk about where there are common items and where there might be differences. So. Um, who is in group one or, or it doesn't really matter but whichever group wants to go oh um okay i'm going to look i'm going to see um norwood why don't you tag and then i tagged molly <laughs> what or is it molly i don't know are you the same group uh yeah uh yoko okay, molly and norwood were all, all, when we, we talk well yoko would you tell it from your perspective because it, you experienced it firsthand regarding our conversation about communication over there in Eastern Kentucky for you. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm situated in Eastern Kentucky, Whitesburg. And um, so we just had the catastrophic flood. Um, and um, my organization's primary uh, uh, concern is, is the community and serving the community. And so um, we were talking about, well, how do you can you communicate when your communication is down? Um, and so uh, I in a nutshell, I think what what came about with this is that we have to be prepared to go to old school and figure out how we are going to connect with these people who are, completely isolated in rural situations um, and their bridges washed out. Their car is gone. Um, they're in the house for days, and so that's the kind of um, thing that we we talked about. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Anything else in, in this group that was a kind of issue that came up for the others in the group about what would be a core substantive um, critical operation? Molly, you brought up the warning system, and I and that's about where we were heading uh, before we broke out. Yeah, I think we basically communications was kind of the big thing that we talked about as kind of the first thing after life and property safety that we need to think about is how to have our communications and mm -hmm. alternate communications ready. Is that um, a procedural issue, or you think that that's a programmatic issue? I'm wondering. I mean, how, and you, how do you, how do you interpret the difference between procedure and pro, pro, yeah. programmatic? I mean, I think when you're doing it, you know, it's really kind of more that you're just going to generate things within your organization, and and you know, but but I think that there are things that have to do with mission, and you're and that sort of mission, like, is there if you are a presenting organization or an organization that creates work or somebody that generates work, then probably the most important thing is like, how do we continue to deliver? our services to people. Now, obviously communication is gonna be part of that, but I almost think of that more, you know, that is procedural. How do we do this thing that is critical to us? So you're trying to think, what are our, our activities and our services if you're an organization? And then how do we render those? That's more procedural, right? That's the how. So there's the what and the how. Um, you know, payroll, obviously, as I brought up before, like you have to pay your staff if you're an organization that's vitally important, right? I mean, you know, or, or you have to think about, do we have to lay staff off? How are you going to make those determinations? 
Um, and I'm going to be giving you guys at the end of this, you're not going to get it today, but later, a kind of business continuity template that I've created that's a really a whole system for how you can think these things through. And it will talk very specifically about some HR issues as well. So, you know, it's sort of, a, it's a bit but you can use it hopefully to help you. But that's how I would sort of draw a distinction between the substance and the procedure, the what, the how. Um, any, um, so, so what about, um, unless this group wants to add anything else, I'm curious, what, what about the next group? Somebody wanna raise their hand and unmute and tell us? We had two more groups. So I don't know who was in group two <laughs> or which was which. Jessica, do we know? Do you have anyone that wants to share anything else? Um, we were in group three and Carlos, uh, he's a mosaic artist. He had a really good um, relaying how he got through the pandemic. I, I'm going to turn it over to him. I was impressed. Hello, everyone. Um, so, well, there were in our group were three different artists and then we have a director in Chapel Hill that manages arts. So so it was interesting to talk to all three of them. And in general, in my case, as an artist and the other two artists that we talked about, I think more or less is like something that impacts really hard to an artist. It's just like the sudden stopness of anything of your medium that you're working on. So I guess to being um, having preparedness to deal with the new circumstances of any emergency is wise. And in my case, like material would be something really hard to get to make mosaics or even just having workshops um, because people couldn't actually come to them. So so what I did is I found a way to make my own material 100% um, recyclable from um, a recycling plant here in Wilson, North Carolina. And we made a public art piece not too long ago for Gastonia. So I maintained myself with work by finding new um, possibilities to make work and I went almost uh, digitally for workshops so people can actually make mosaics through like a video or through something like that and mm -hmm. you know every artist I'm sure experiences different ways on how to um, process certain emergencies like a hurricane or a flood from Kentucky like um, Joko said but I think in general is is just important to to have a certain knowledge of a preparation and just the tools and community that you can talk to so they can help you out and not try to take this all by yourself because it's hard just with any situation in general and especially if it's an emergency you have to get help and ask for help to whatever organization you know as many are here and just make sure that that connectivity connection is there so so everything doesn't break through absolutely I mean, I think you've said so many vitally important things. You know, you brought up this idea of community, how that's a support, how you have to pivot and how you think about that. I mean, obviously for an artic, artist, if you're a generative artist, a creative artist, it's like, how do I continue to do my work? And for some, it's just really easy. Yeah, go into the studio, right? But definitely one of the issues throughout COVID was that we had supply chain issues. So things were not available. And that's incredibly impressive and ingenious, you know, that you came to discover something totally new about how you could go forward with your work, both in, and you talked about two things that would be important for artists, right? It's doing the work itself. And then for people who are teaching artists, how do I go out and do that? And I, I will say that for many artists, what happens after disasters and arts organizations, not the subject of this class, but people become very involved in community recovery through arts and culture. And artists often pivot to that. How can I serve my community after a disaster, right? That's an incredibly important thing. Most artists and arts organizations I know after disasters do that completely naturally. It just comes to them because they want to serve. And it's an incredible thing about those of us in the arts community. Um, what some of us are trying to do is to make sure that maybe you might be able to get money in order to do that so that it's not just a volunteer activity as wonderful as that is. But, <laughs> um, you know, these are the important things. So incredible story. Um, for Gerilyn and Myrna, does either of you want to speak up? Do you, Myrna, do you have something you want to add? I see, I'm Gerilyn. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing names correctly. I uh, you, did, you did great yeah. with mine. Um, I'm Myrna and um, I'm serving in two roles. One as a uh, professional performer, performing artist, a singer. Um, and um, um, I consider us artists as essential workers that were not compensated. Um, we've, Free art was available, especially performing arts was available for free. And that's a challenge today because people are accustomed to getting free entertainment at home. 
And so it's, it continues to be an issue um, mm -hmm. as it's coming on as who is accustomed to be able to entertain um, outwardly. And so mm -hmm. venues in Atlanta, which is where I'm based, um, for the most part, um, are really not open and many of them closed. Um, and so it's, it's very challenging um, in the space of clubs and venues. Um, and, and so as the founder and executive director for the nonprofit Showability, it works with performing arts with disabilities, um, from an organization standpoint, we had to pivot because all of our programming was in person, uh, whether we went, did disability awareness career days at elementary schools um, and things like that, and so um, as well as performances. And so we had to quickly pivot uh, virtually and offer programming. Um, and we did master classes, and um, and we also thought about the caregiver uh, that was at home with the person with disability. And so we also offered mental health and mental wellness uh, programming as well for for them, um, as well because just recognizing that you're 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 you're, you're what's it? I forgot the terminology now. Um, you're stuck at home. I, that's not what they said. <laughs> but but Gerilyn um, had great experience um, with dance in Mobile uh, with, with their organization doing things in person and virtually. I can she can speak about that herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm unique in that I'm not an artist. And we are strictly volunteers, but we've been able to get event grant event specific to bring quality programs to underserved communities in the local area. Mm -hmm. So our biggest challenge was we were trying to bring a, a dance group to Mobile, and we had to change several times because of COVID, which ended up we weren't ever, ever able to bring that group here. But then we pivoted this year and brought in a large dance collective in, from Memphis. And uh, I guess uh, two of those two previous ones gave us smaller groups. We had the University of Alabama dance group and we had an Alabama-based entity. And we learned from some things that we've done with smaller groups. So by the time we were able to bring a large last month in October, mm -hmm. we were able to serve over 12, close to 1,200 students from Mobile County Public Schools system got to see the basic industry. So I guess in some respects, we learned because we were from the, having smaller events during the pandemic, so that was a plus. Right. Still learning, but um, anyway, I guess that's what I, that was our big challenge because we're just volunteers trying to make a difference. Yeah. So I want to say, which is a common theme emerging. I mean, clearly for everyone, you know, the most uh, important thing is your ability to deliver your mission, number one. I would say that's, you know, sort of when you go back and you can take this further, you might be working with different members of your staff. And I would advise if you're an organization, people at all levels can help you. The person who's front of house, if you have a space, they may be there and they may know things that you don't, right? So we can learn from people in all places in an organization who may think of things differently. But clearly it's always about mission delivery and you all learn this lesson of how to pivot in a particular kind of disaster. But what you're gonna to wanna to do, and we're gonna move now to risks, is you have to identify your risks, your potential risks. And then you have to then, the next step would be, how do you then think through in an imaginary way or a way, because you've already experienced it sometime in the past, how certain risks might impact all those things that are important to you, right? And then we're gonna, we'll, we'll be talking then about assets too. What are your assets? So you're identifying your risks, you're identifying your assets. And when we get to the assets, that may cause you to think through whatever it was you thought were critical operations before, right? Or critical procedures before. But these are kind of, these are sort of kind of baby steps to take you towards being able to create a plan. You need to know what's going to impact you. You need to project then how it might impact you. You need to identify vulnerabilities, like if you are a presenting organization and there's a problem in your space somewhere that could allow leaks in onto the stage, for instance, well, one would think that would be a priority kind of action to take well in advance of a disaster, right? So you kind of do it in these kind of building these steps, 
and then it's putting it all together, right? And we're just doing a few of these basic things today to give you a way to start to think it through and break down what might otherwise be this overwhelming process. So again, I, I wanted to say the key thing that I've been hearing here from really everyone is the, I, the ability that you learned about how to pivot, how to be ingenious. It feels like all of you have that flexibility gene in you um, to some extent, you were able to do it. So congratulations, right? You got through that and you made it. And that's what we also know then is disaster management exists in a cycle. There's before a disaster. That's when we plan and prepare. The disaster happens. After we see what worked and what didn't, we may go through recovery, but then we're assessing what worked, what didn't, exactly what you're talking about. What lessons did we learn? How do you take these lessons from COVID and think them through to help you the next time something might happen, a different kind of disaster. So um, we're gonna go to the next slide in the PowerPoint. I wanted to talk about a little bit about something called process management. And this is like a much bigger thing. It has many applications, but it's kind of thing that's got somewhat in vogue and certain in business, but it's a great way to think things through. It's about thinking processes. Like how do you identify processes in your organization? How do you use processes or in your life to think through how to do things, right? So process management would say that if you have an issue, um, number one, Molly wrote this, other people wrote this before, document, document, document. There are ways you do things. If only one person in your organization, and this wouldn't be the same thing for artists, but if only one person knows how to do something, um, unless you're a studio artist and you employ people and work with other people or work collaboratively, that's not good enough. No, only one person should know everything in your organization or only a few things. You must always have redundancy and that's redundancy and backups in people. That's redundancy and backups in systems. So what some people do to think this through is when you identify these critical operations and processes, you document how is that done so that anyone else could go in and know how it's done. So if somebody is out and sick and they can't be communicated with, somebody else knows, somebody else can go somewhere and find the information they need to know in order to do that. Um, and so, um, and that there's more than one person, at least, at least two, if not more than two for all critical operations, all critical procedures. Okay. So redundancy also means, um, that what you're doing is that it's redundant. If you have information, right. Information is actually going to be not just online. What happens if you have a natural disaster and power goes out? If you don't have a hard copy, somebody said it earlier, we went, we went, you know, old, old school, <laughs> old school. Yeah, you got to have it on paper. Maybe you have it in more than one location in the office and at the home of the executive director or somebody else. Um, you also have it in the cloud, but I'm going to tell you the cloud is great, but if your communications go out and they're out for beyond, out beyond a certain amount of time, you're not going to be able to access the cloud either. What would that redundancy and backup kind of thing also mean? That means have more than one backup battery. So at least you can prolong things. So that's what we mean, redundancy and backups, put together flow charts or descriptions of critical procedures, make those available to those who need to know, and that's the documentation, okay? So that's a way to really think about things to increase your ability to be able to function well in and through disasters. So now, Jessica, um, we can move to the next slide, which is the risk slide. Um, these are not necessarily processing all that well on screen. So I'm going to read it. And you guys also do have the worksheets. We're just going to talk about this and you can go check it. If you have, if you have your worksheet out, we're going to do this together as a group, or you can, um, go back and do this another time. But to let you know, this worksheet actually comes from a resource that you're going to get a link to. 
and that is the um, Cultural Placekeeping Guide. That is a publication that the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response created. I was the primary author. I believe that Molly might have worked on parts of it. Other folks did. Um, and it really is a how-to book. It's chiefly about how do you build what we call a cultural placekeeping network, which would be kind of network that you can put in place amongst a group of artists, a group of arts organizations in your locale, or some combination thereof, to act as a communications and coordination network. But one of the things we did there, that may not be something you want to do, but there are some worksheets there that might be useful to you as you think about preparing. So um, we're going to talk about, you know, what are risks? And before I said, you know, we divide them oftentimes into sort of natural events, human-made events, and climate change is very much a hybrid event, right? So that's something new. So as we go through here, um, maybe Jessica, we don't need to see the screen, but we can bring it back to the group and people can either do a thumbs up or raise a hand and, um, and we can see what, you know, might be something that are affecting all of you. And some of this we went through before, but we're just gonna go through again, um, just briefly. So we have, and I've, we've broken them down in sort of to categories. So in natural events, we have wind related events. Tornadoes, how many of you is that a risk for? Okay. Um, hurricanes in other places, they're called cyclones or even tropical storms. How many folks? In the Southeast, I would imagine that's pretty much everyone, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, what about wind storms, other kinds of storms? Anyone, okay. And then damaging high winds that may just arise not connected to another event. Okay. And then we have water related kinds of events, heavy rains and thunderstorms, floods and flash floods. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, again, we, we don't have to repeat hurricanes, cyclones, mudslides wasn't an issue for anyone before, but what about hail? Do people, do people get hail at all in the Southeast? I don't even know. I'm, I'm in the Northeast. Okay. So that is an issue. Um, tsunamis we shall leave out because that's probably not there. But on the West Coast, there have been or there were tsunamis that people thought were going to come, right? In Puerto Rico, there was a tsunami or there was a warning of one, right? They have a warning system. Um, sinkholes, probably not that common. Um, when we get to temperature related, cold and extreme cold. People did report that before. And there can be real impacts from that, right? Um, heat and extreme heat. Um, you know, as climate change increases and, and, you know, things, this is going to be more and more of an issue for people, right? But, you know, this really the ability to withstand a heat wave. Um, um, drought and water shortage. Okay. So people have experienced that. So, you know, you know, you, if you're thinking through what do we need to do? Well, we have bottled water. We have, you know, I mean, how do you do deal with your plants? I mean, what can you put in place? I mean, that would be on maybe on a personal level, unless this is organizational. Um, but um, but that's something you have to think about. Snow and ice storms, pretty common. Okay. Um, other weather kind of events, um, earthquakes. Anyone? Okay. All right. Earthquakes are really hard, right? Because you don't really get very much warning for an earthquake, but you can think about how do I proof my facility, where I live, where I work as much as possible. You need to know what are the rules. If an earthquake comes, where is it you're supposed to go, right? That's the kind of thing I had to read about once, you know, like, oh, you go into the doorway or you find an inner room, right? Those are the kinds of things that take you to a next place. What about lightning? Lightning strikes can be very damaging. Um, gosh, the sun is coming into my home, like right in my eyes right now. Wildfires, is this an issue for anyone? Very devastating, especially out on the West Coast, but I see some people who have to think about that. Other kinds of fires, right? We have mass incidents and then we have incidents that can affect us just in our own facility. So that's about how fireproof are you? Have you done, are you up to code? Have you done things you need to? And I know for a lot of organizations, a very big issue here is that, um, that sometimes you don't have the money. You, like you don't want the fire department coming in because you know you're not up to code. You don't have the money to undertake the things that you need to. So you have to find certain kinds of hacks, right? And there are things you can learn. Um, I can try and 
find you some resources for that. It's not in the materials we're already sending, but really important to understand that, like what is most vitally important. And I would say to you in that kind of situation, almost any situation is you can get like this light up um, tape that you can put on floors to ensure that people can see their pathway out. Everyone should always know what is the evacuation route, right? One of the most important things you can think about. So there are certain things that you need to think, what's the most important thing if this were to happen? Like, what can we do that's easy? What can we do that's cheap? And we can make sure that it's in place. Um, I'm not gonna go through the rest of that on there, but you can see um, when we have um, human risks, mass shootings, something that unfortunately is something groups think about more and more. I will recognize Performing Arts Readiness has a very good workshop on this that you can take that's free to sign up for. Um, and we will give you that information later. But what about, are you near a chemical plant? Anybody's organization near some kind of facility that could have a leak, right? You need to think about that. Again, evacuation or what's a safe room inside? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect ourselves personally? Um, Cyber attacks. Anybody ever have, have a cyber attack at all, right? How do you teach your staff? Aside from setting up what you need to programmatically, how do you teach your staff what not to do, right? Phishing scams, what you don't open up, things you kind of need to repeat on an annual basis. Um, so be aware of your environment around you, where there are hazardous materials, where there might be, you know, sort of, um, are there going to be civil disturbances that can affect your ability to actually mount a performance at some point? Being aware, building your relationship with your community, so maybe you won't get impacted by certain things. That's always really important. Being a really good relationship with community is always vital. Um, and so you've, a lot of folks talked about power outages and blackouts. Do you have the money for a generator? That's probably not affordable for most, but some places have that. Or where can you go? Oftentimes in a disaster, in Puerto Rico, there were foundations and other groups that opened their facilities to people. Anyone could come and do charging there. We can think of our libraries for that. So knowing the places that are out there, that if you can't do certain things, where people can go, how you and your organization might be a community resource. So you have this checklist, you can use it as a guide on your own to go through with your staff and think through, this is what impacts us, right? Um, a hazard, as I said before, does not need to result in a disaster. The better prepared you are to deal with it, the less likely that is. Okay, and, and, and when we think of impact, I want you to think it's not just gonna be physical impact, there can be emotional impact on staff, on yourself. If you're busy rendering service to your community, Please take time for yourselves to get the help that you need so there's no burnout, right? You need to have that support as well. Sometimes folks that are doing arts management, they're not thinking about that as much. They're just going through it and doing it. But it's really important for you personally and your staff. Um, so um, let's move to, um, oh, and I just want to mention briefly, because we're, we're sort of, you know, we didn't start on time. So we have a little bit I want to go through, but when we, you know, we, we had the, some problems, but when you are thinking about this, you also want to be thinking about really going through your facility, looking at vulnerabilities, where, where do you notice them? What do you need to address? So as well as the hazard, where do you see vulnerabilities? And that can be in relationships and how you work together. It doesn't just have to be a physical thing, right? Good tool to use, go through and video everything also. One that gives you, we're gonna talk about assets now, an inventory, easy, quick way to do that. Make sure you're not the only one who has the copy. Make sure you can have it somewhere else that it's accessible if power goes out or you've written it down to, or you have you know, some hard copy version of it. But that's an easy way to start to identify your assets. And that's what we're gonna to go to now. So next screen. Um, and what I wanna say about assets, and you'll see on this, um, is that we want to think about assets are just like, oh, it actually, yeah, it, people in relationships. So that might mean the people on your staff, your board, your audience, your vendors, if you're an artist, your collaborators, the gigs, the places that you regularly perform at, places you exhibit with, people and relationships, and then things. And I put mission in things, it's not, you know, but it's what you do. But property, real property, do you own a facility? Property that's there on site, right? Your collections, the things that you use to create your work. These are all what your assets are, are and you need to identify them. And in the business continuity plan that I'm sending you, 
you will see that there is a there are um, there is information there, a sort of worksheet about how to work that through, suggestions for what to think about. But let's just take now five minutes for people to get into breakout groups again and talk about this idea of what you think assets are, what that means to you, and try to identify a few of your own in the people relationship category and then in the thing category. So we'll just take five minutes for this because we're really running close to time now. Okay, welcome back all. Um, so I can we have a presenter from group one to talk about what you discussed and what you might have found out and realized? Anything important that came up? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll say we, um, well, we talked about um, tangible and intangible assets. So assets being, for instance, relationships. So at NIFA, our relationship with the Rauschenberg Foundation, so that they actually came in to add money for an artist emergency grant. Um, so maintaining those kinds of connections. Um, we also talked about the fact that um, uh, keeping hard copies of basic information like uh, people's phone numbers, you know, we rely on, you know, everything's in here. But if your phone's dead or if you have to use someone else's phone, you can't auto dial, like having, you know, your your staff and your board members and things like that written down and, and having that list in multiple places. Um, and then Yoko was talking about, you know, even in uh, and and um, either Yoko or Norwood talk about that idea. Oh, Norwood the, in Ukraine about the world oral history and oral culture. Would you say a minute about that? Because That was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There, recently, there was a cool um, arts and health, arts and healing kind of related conversation. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by Russia and Ukraine and how the culture is being disseminated and how does that play out in recovery. And one of these articles said that doing oral histories following a decimation or loss, grieving, helps to rebuild the soul and the spirit of the community and make it a tangible thing as part of a recovery project. Very beautiful, very beautiful idea. Yeah, thank you. Um, what about in group two? Does somebody want to report about some ideas that came up for you about assets? Vanessa, do you want to share what you, um, I am keep volunteering people, sorry, but what you, what you talked about was so meaningful to me. Um, sure. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, so for for me, what I commented on was that the the main asset for me was kind of localized um, resources because I tend to move around from country to country, and so um, the best thing that I have found was to really make everything local, everything from material resources to local re relationships, so that you have that support system already in place whenever an emergency happens. And the other side was probably slightly more importantly is the mental well-being aspect of all of these issues um, because you can't do anything if you're not in the right place mentally and emotionally and we've seen um, uh, we've seen that in emergency situations uh, the first the first and most important asset from emergency responders is actually uh, psychological first aid and so this is actually quite important and it, I, I don't think that this is something that's being addressed enough in the arts industry where um, artists need to begin to address our own mental and psychological emotional well-being mm -hmm. so that's like a primary asset that we have that's kind of untapped yeah mm -hmm. you know it's interesting because I think a lot of the conversations in terms of issues uh, for artists in particular I, I think we've been seeing moving also from a, a sort of a notion of not addressing it from sort of being recovering from a disaster it's kind of and it's not just about preparedness but we're really moving into a place of thinking not just about that but health in general so if you are in a healthy place starting like you said that that is a base and that is totally something that is not addressed well enough in this entire country look at how we fund even within health plans coverage for physical ailments 
versus mental and emotional health, right? I mean, we as a country really need to take huge steps forward. I mean, one thing I will say is this whole notion of addressing community, you know, and being part of community can very much help with that. And I will put out a resource here, um, which is the Entertainment Community Fund for those of you who are in the performing arts sector and you do not have to be an actor. It used to be the Actors Fund, but anyone in that profession, and sometimes after disasters, they open up their services, but they do provide social services to organizations, to individual artists in different disciplines. So that's really important. And Jessica has just put, put forth Surf Plus, which is an amazing resource um, for studio-based artists. And they have huge amounts of preparedness information. Um, does anyone wanna add anything else about this notion for them of assets? I'm, I am gonna be providing you sort of this, these worksheets you know, and information that you'll get in the continuity plan to help think it through. but you know, your assets are your strengths and they're the things that you want to make sure that you protect, you know, and, and it's about going forward then and doing that. Um, so uh, if, does anyone have something else to add? Because if not, we can move to the last slide and I do just want to address sort of what next, you know, where do we take this? Because we've just done a little bit of taste here um, of things, but um So next steps, I mean, you're gonna, you're taking it back home from here, whatever that means to you, to your organization, to yourself, to your community. Um, if you're an organization, you know, these are identifying your core assets and critical operations and procedures. Again, you need to bring your staff into it, whether it's just department heads or you're really extending that to others. And I, I really advise that. Um, you know, you can break it down by each department, identifying it within a department and bringing their staff together to come to that. Different perspectives. Is your audience, maybe are they useful, you know, your community in thinking about that? Maybe their ideas about what you render and what's most important about you, your artwork is different than what you might self-identify. So you're gonna sort of do that, bring it from different people's perspectives and then you want to kind of broaden it out and then hone it. So you might get a lot of information and then you want to sort of bring it back and make it in some kind of manageable form. When you understand then you have the hazards, the assets, how you're projecting, how they can impact you. And then thinking, how can we address that? What steps can we take? You're going to think far in advance, what might be important to do. And some of those things might not be affordable now but you wanna think what's quick and easy and cheap to do that we can do. Don't overwhelm yourselves though, especially you know at all. I mean, it, it, organizationally, individually, um, you really want to give yourself the opportunity to think things through. This is not a race, this is a marathon, unless there's an immediate disaster coming your way. You wanna break it down into digestible bites and do what you can and getting a peer support group, you know, if there are ways to build that, I mean, Jessica and I discussed that possibility, you know, are there people you've met here that are either in your community, community with whom you can work? Sometimes just having a buddy, even if it's just one other person to sort of say, okay, especially for the artists, you know, okay, this is the step I'm gonna take today. Like, let's do this one thing per month. Can we do that and check in with each other and see how it went and talk about issues? Find local resources, as Vanessa said, vitally important, having that in place, knowing what that is. Um, and then when we think about building out and building relationships, we can build them within the arts sector. And this brings us to some of our resources. Clearly South Arts is a resource for you. Um, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. D plan and arts ready. And excuse me, because I made a typo and didn't realize it till afterwards. It's arts ready, but you have a link to it here. This is an actual online tool that was created by South Arts, by NCAPER, with another organization, Northeast Documentation. I always get the name wrong, but it comes more from the cultural heritage world. And it is an online tool you can use to ask the questions there is a pretty reasonable fee to join and be able to utilize this tool now. It is affordable. And if you have issues, you know, please talk to South Arts. I don't want to speak for you, Jessica and Karanda, but you know, this is an amazing tool that you can use and it's there to help you think these things through. 
You're going to get my business continuity plan template, another way to think things through. But start with these steps, and then you're just going to do it bit by bit. Always learn from past mistakes. How do you need to change what you did? It's all a cycle. We're going to send you more resources. National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response is an arts management kind of, um, we're building the infrastructure in the arts sector, but I'm going to advise you in the organizations, particularly those of you in government, if you don't already have ongoing relationships with your local offices of emergency management, state offices of emergency management. Um, oh, Jessica says it's free this year for performing arts. So that's fabulous. Um, and also with FEMA. FEMA is organized by regions, and I can send that information in the future to you. Go online. If I can't get you, the, the, you might be able to find the context there. But the more you build these relationships in advance, the more it will serve you in the future. Um, and be a community for each other. Um, feel free also, if people have questions, you know, you, um, I am, you can send me an email. I'll handle what I can. Um, but I'm happy to be a sort of guide for you for a while. So let's bring us back together. Just if anyone has questions, I, I know, you know, we're sort of right on time or a little bit over, but I want to, um, you know, see if there are important questions or comments that people have that, um, you know, that they, especially if it's a question that you want to ask. Again, we've just started, we've taken baby steps to give you sort of three tasks that you can take to work your way forward in a, an emergency or business kind of continuity plan, which is really about how can we continue to operate even when such and such happens. So any questions? Amy, I don't have a question, but I wanted to sort of, as you all were in the breakout, we were talking a little bit about some of the different areas in the US and you know, one of the things um, I'm in, involved in some um, economic development initiatives at locally in, in the city of Atlanta, and also, um, you know, I'm, I'm working towards uh, my MPA in planning and economic development. And, and some of the stuff that I've learned about how uh, the cities that we live in or the communities or the towns, you know, what are they prepared for? And we are ill-equipped. <laughs> to start thinking about coastal retreat. And um, it's a big issue. And so I think that there are opportunities sometimes where there are deficiencies, there are opportunities for the arts to engage in this process. And so I would encourage you, you know, um, to maybe have a conversation with a local elected official about this. You know, that's their job to go and to talk to you. You have the right to petition your government and talk to them. So go have a cup of coffee with your local official, have these conversations, start talking about what the arts can do because there's a huge need from planners to educate the public about what is to come. And as we look at 10, 20, 50 years out, um, our world is gonna look a lot differently. And so um, it, the arts are this mechanism that we have, that we all are equipped to do um in in helping make sure that you know humanity is safe mm -hmm. yeah definitely definitely um and there is one other resource I, I do believe the application period closed but it will very likely open up again that NCAPER has been offering with another group called air um and that this is called the crisis analysis and mitigation project. And they are actually training people within arts organizations to build these relationships outward to their local emergency management, to state, to federal, and each group person develops a project within their region. But I can't stress enough, I mean, Jessica said it, go to your local elected official, build the relationships that you need. I will tell you that I got my job in the Sandy recovery office after Hurricane Sandy, there was nothing in place. In FEMA's work, it didn't say, we do recovery for artists and arts organizations. But because I had been at the New York Arts Recovery Fund after 9-11, I built a relationship with a man who was working in a certain capacity at FEMA. He's called a voluntary agency liaison. He's someone who then later built a relationship with our entire arts national and caper movement. He then became the person who ran the recovery office in New York State after Sandy. And I came in 
to work on the recovery of artists and arts organizations. It was not in the sort of management book that that would be there. But you build relationships, they redound in the future. So that's one of the most important things I can say to everyone. Peer support relationships, relationships with the emergency sector, with your electeds, become part of that and definitely provide the voice about the arts, as Jessica said. Anything else? Well, oh, yes. Yeah. I have, a, I have a, a kind of off the wall question if there's time. Um, it's something that I've been pondering about with um, arts and health and recovery and disaster preparedness. Um, through this work uh, and even like through art therapy, um, has has for you, any of you, have has this work um, inspired you to reevaluate or reflect a little differently on what art and art making is or could be or is for culture? Are you addressing that to everyone in the in the room? It, I, absolutely, it, it's it's been on my mind because I keep coming back to we're putting all this emphasis in something that, you know, you want it to be quantitative or qualitative defined so that you can get grant money, etc. And the importance, and, you know, as an artist, I'm going really, you know, my eyes are brown. How do you want me to prove this? Um, must mm -hmm. we go there, and to what extent? So it, I'm finding myself reevaluating arts, and I'm wondering, <laughs> and what art is, and the core principle of why we value this, et cetera, and so on. And and through emergency planning work, when you're getting down to these nuggets of what is assets and why, I'm just wondering if anyone else or uh, that that's up. Yeah. And I want to comment on that real quick, Norwood. Um, so when the flood hit and this this community center was not a flood location. So it was one of the community centers that survived the flood. And um, there was an after school arts program that was going on that just ended like right at at the flood because it was in the summer. Um, however, the schools had closed, and so we continued the after-school program and offered arts education to to the, the the children. And so we could free up the parents to deal with their homes that were dis, you know destroyed or they're lost or whatever. Um, but this region, particularly, we do not have um, K through eight art education at all in music or art, and so for the children to have a place to come to and to kind of like um, mend each other's trauma through being together and making art or playing music or dancing or whatever. That was just, I mean, I mean it was just priceless. And so I, I can't, I, I've witnessed this and, and it's something that was really hit home well, for me as an artist and that that needed art as, as I was growing up. Yeah. Um, at, at Performing Arts Readiness, I had co-developed with someone an entire webinar. I'm, I'm hoping to revise it and get them to sponsor it again called Community Recovery Through Arts and Culture. And um, I can tell you that in Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria, the very first people on the ground, among the very first, were artists, artistic troops, um, not first responders, they weren't even able to get in and they went around. The Puerto Rico Symphony went around the island, uh, um, circus troops, theater troops, visual artists. It was so vitally important. And there's an amazing, you may still be able to find it, kind of photo essay about this that the Washington Post did years ago. Um, and one thing that's interesting, I have a background in dance um, and I know people who are dance therapists and you raise the idea of sort of arts therapy. Artists and arts therapists actually approach this all a little bit differently, but it's vitally important artist healing. The one thing I would advise to artists getting involved in this is just remember that you're not a therapist and issues can arise sometimes in that kind of recovery space that you wanna make sure that you might have a professional available to you to consult with or to refer people to. You know, we heal, but we need to be aware of what can happen. And then we need to be aware of our own mental health and how we approach it. Um, I know someone who's a dance therapist who worked with, you know, in, in Rwanda, the boy warriors, the ones who were impressed into service and were actually going out killing people. He's a dance therapist who did work in Rwanda. And it's extraordinary work that was done and healing that was accomplished. So 
I agree with it. And people do recognize it. FEMA recognizes it. They recognize that culture is vitally important in recovery. Um, the CDC about a year ago did an RFP where they asked arts organizations um, to submit um, work. And this was more about messaging, but it was about messaging how the arts can be involved in messaging, in preparedness. Their people were not wanting to take their COVID vaccines. They reached out to the arts sector to get involved in that. So there is recognition about it. I think what we really need um, is more discussion, something more, and then people really are paid. Uh, that's what I think. I think people need to be paid for doing this work. It's wonderful to do it for free and it's an instinct, but to make sure that we're getting compensation for the arts workers. Well, how do you establish that value in a monetary, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's like tithing in church. Yeah. Right. I think if I, if I may, there's, you know, been some, I love studies, so I'll just share, but there have been some, um, you know, work around this, and when we, you know, in the in the planning world, when you look at sustainability, there are our resiliency is a part of sustainability. So it's a you can be a little bit broader in where the arts fit in, but um, as far as resiliency goes, you know, there was a study that was done um, with um, the San Francisco um, Federal Reserve Bank. And in the findings, they did find they did disclose that cities that invested more in arts and culture were more financially resilient in the face of economic disaster. And so, you know, those are are studies that you can use. You know, again, I always tell this to people in business: like we make decisions based on emotion and justify with logic, right? So there is an emotional appeal that artists are great at. Lean into that but then back it up with the logic piece. So people feel great about, you know, they don't have buyer's remorse when they're funding you. Um, and so, um, but there's that study. And then there's of course the Urban Institute linked studies that were done from 2003 to 2013. And, um, and really, you know, before we were thinking of this term creative placemaking, that's what a lot of the work was about. But there's even studies about health and the correlation between the amount of arts funding that is in a community, the amount of artists who live in a community, you know, communities that have more artist residents, um, the whole community is less likely to be victims of, or citizens be victims of racial violence. And so there's a lot of different angles. And I think the CDC is also paying attention to this now as we kind of come out of the pandemic. Um, there's still a lot we don't know, there's still, you know, my sister's an RN and there are things that she's reporting that we're not even hearing about um, that's happening because of the result of the pandemic. So we have a ways to go to heal. Definitely a need for art. And I will say uh, the Bloomberg Foundation has an RFP out right now. I believe it's just for, it's actually maybe for cities, but it is is about um, how can we integrate arts and culture into areas of crisis. So I don't have the link right in front of me, but take a look and see if you can get your voice in with your city um, and say, we want to be part of this through your department, you know, cultural affairs. I mean, I know, you know, you in North Carolina, you know, in Chapel Hill, perhaps. Um, and I think that there are awards of, I think, $100,000 for projects. So. So thank you, Amy, so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody um, who stayed with us throughout this whole call. Um, I know there were a couple of people who messaged me who wanted to stay on and they had to hop off, but we will you know, share the recording of this and have it captioned um, to share out. And please let folks know if you can in your network that um, they have a tool that they can access, which is the D-Plan Arts Ready, which we mentioned. And, and if you know performing arts organizations that um, it, where it may not be on their radar, please share that information because the Mellon Foundation has generously offered free memberships to uh, D-Plan Arts Ready. And if you're not a performing arts organization, the entry in for that is really minimal and, and I think definitely worth it. Um, and so these kinds of workshops, we hope to continue to just sort of, as Amy said, we're taking these baby steps and it sounds like there's an interest in thinking about um, how culture fits into recovery and resiliency and even long-term sustainability. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Karanda. 
uh, Baker from South Arts for uh, helping us with the tech piece. Uh, um, always great to have you with me. And thank you again, Amy, and thank you all and have a lovely, lovely Thursday. Thank you so much, all. Um, and I'll, you can get my email from, Jessica will send it out with some more resources that will be coming your way. Oops, sorry for that. That's my phone. <laughs> I have another meeting soon. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully all. Bye, everyone. <laughs>